Senate Constitutional Amendment 14 by Senator Wolk and accolading to the legislature. Excuse me, this is on the regular file. Senate third reading, file item 65. Senator Leno. I'm sorry, Senator Wolk. Senator Leno just can't put his mic down. It's <laughs> Senator Wolk, my apologies. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, members. This is the beginning of a very, this could be the beginning of a very significant journey. If approved by both houses of the legislature and the voters, SCA 14, combined with its companion statute, AB 884, Assemblymember Gordon is the author, which you will not vote on today, which will be voted on uh, shortly in the future. Those two measures would enact the California Legislative Transparency Act. The core piece of SCA 14, that is the constitutional amendment, is a requirement for 72 hours of online public review in both houses before the final approval and passage of any bill. It includes, of course, an exemption for 72-hour review in the cases where the governor declares an emergency, appropriately so. It will also require audiovisual recordings be made of all legislative proceedings in the Capitol, as well as any other proceeding where a vote or action is taken in the Capitol. And for informational hearings outside the Capitol where no actions are taken, it requires all reasonable efforts be made to record those hearings as well, whether they're in the Trinity Alps or at the Salton Sea. SCA 14 requires all of these recordings to be made promptly available to the public, requires that all reasonable efforts to provide live streaming of our proceedings, and for recordings to remain accessible to the public for at least 20 years. The companion bill, which you will see at another time, AB 884 in the Assembly, will provide implementing language that will do the following. It will put all audiovisual recordings into the public domain, which is important because it removes perceived and real barriers to the public access. 884 will also eliminate legislative copyright protections that are currently in law and can be seen to be, and have been seen to be a barrier. It will provide members of the public the right to record and broadcast open and public proceedings of the legislature with their own equipment, just as we do for all other public state agencies through the bagley keene Act, provided they are not disruptive. Colleagues, I have some history on this, uh, along with Senator Huff, Correa de Saulnier, Assemblymember Olson, and others who joined with me in 2013 to author SCA 10. It focused on the 72-hour in print rule. That effort, although supported broadly, never even got a hearing, and subsequent attempts met the same fate. So what's changed? First, there's been growing interest in this legislature from both sides of the aisle to increase transparency and to reduce and curb the practice known as gut and amend, where bills, as you know, receive very little public review before a vote. And with credit to our pro tem, we have seen progress on this. There have been fewer and fewer of such measures every year since he assumed the leadership. This year's budget, for example, as well as all trailer bills, have been online 72 hours or longer before a vote on the floor. We've also moved to televise and add live streaming proceedings to more and more of our hearings. As the technology has improved, so have we. Now all Senate hearings in the Capitol are televised live and online, and they're archived. Our informational hearings around the state are recorded and made available to the public in almost every instance. And the Assembly is making progress here as well. We've done all this voluntarily, 
but it's very fair to say, I'll be very honest about that, that we wouldn't be here moving this measure today were it not for the effort of former Senator Sam Blakesley and Dr. Charles Munger. They gathered signatures to put on the ballot a measure that will do most of what you have in front of you today. And I commend them for that. In fact, I introduced SCA 14 at the initiatives propon at the proponents request to give us, the legislature, one more last try to get it right and correct any, any, and correct any errors that were identified after the circulation began and to respond to public comment. So we agree on the goals. 72-hour review of all legislation for both houses. Publicly accessible AV recordings of our proceedings. The right of the public to make their own recordings if not disruptive. But before putting the language in concrete through the initiative, I believe we have an obligation to try and get the details right through a public process. And it's complex and complicated. And I believe, however, we are very, very close to doing just that. We've been working very closely on this with our legislative council, who is the expert in the legislative process and responsible, importantly responsible, for providing the public access to all legislative information, including the new requirements that we are suggesting for the AV re recordings and the live streaming that we are placing into these bills. We believe we've put forward a better approach, more certain to provide the transparency we seek without the unintended consequences of an initiative drafted without this public discussion or consultation. We all know an initiative is difficult to correct. Between SCA 14 and AB 884, which is the, is the implementation mechanism, we believe we have hit those goals. We've been in dialogue with the initiative proponents, as well as our colleagues in the assembly. We've had lengthy hearings on the subject, and I want to thank Senator Hertzberg for standing in for me, for sitting in for me uh, at the uh, recent hearing. We've had a joint hearing on the initiative. This is not the final step. There is still time, albeit short, but there is still time for full discussion, negotiation, for allowing 72 hour in print amendments here and in the assembly. But it means that we need to move this forward to continue the discussion. The assembly, when we move this forward, the Assembly will have yet another opportunity to further strengthen this measure as well as continue to work on 884. We can concur or not with the changes that will come back to us. If we are successful, and I hope we will, and I believe we will be, with goodwill, the initiative proponents will have the opportunity to withdraw their measure, but there is a firm deadline to that. So all that pushes us forward to discuss in earnest and come up with a single measure that we all can support, frankly, or they can keep their measure on the ballot. They have that option. It will be up to them. This is the process as it has been designed to work. I think it's worth a sincere effort. It's what I bring here to you today, and I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Senator Wolk. Under debate or discussion, we will start with Senator Allen, followed by Senator Anderson, Hertzberg, and Morlock. Senator Allen. Oh, mic is down. Then we'll go directly to Senator Anderson. Senators, I first want to uh, thank our colleague from Davis. Uh, she has been on the forefront of this, and it must be frustrating after 14 years of proposing legislation to bring transparency and having ignored or killed in the first committee. So I am completely sympathetic to her plight in trying to bring that transparency to this body and to the assembly. I, uh, nothing is in a void. Uh, when you're looking at legislation, I think you have to take into consideration what are the possibilities and what are the things that are out there? 
And as this bill was presented, I kept asking in, in uh, elections, I kept asking the same question. How is this an improvement over what we know is going to be on the ballot already? You see, crowding the ballot with many initiatives that try to accomplish the same thing can be used as a tool to kill both initiatives, thus leaving voters, leaving constituents without the transparency that they so desire. Over a million people have signed the petition to put the California Legislative Transparency Act on, just as our good Senator from Davis had pointed out. So when we're looking at this, does SCA 14 provide 72-hour notice out of both the Assembly and the Senate and, and distribute it to members and post it on the Internet for at least 72 hours? Because that would, in my opinion, would be optimum. It does not. It only provides it in one house, not both houses. When you look at enforcement, if you don't follow the rules, is there any enforcement in SCA 14? And the answer is no. However, uh, uh, with the Competitive Legislative Transparency, Transparency Act, it would make that law none and void. Now, they could go back and make that correction and post the 72 hours and give people that transparency, and then it could take effect, but prior to that, it would not be enforceable in court. <clears throat> could could uh, SCA 14, does it allow a 72-hour notice be expressed to waive by a separate two-thirds roll call vote in both the Assembly and the Senate? Does it allow this rule to be waived, the 72-hour rule to be waived? And does it require the governor to ask for an emergency in order to do it? Because if we're going to change and take transparency out of this House after we worked so hard to put transparency into it, shouldn't that be an agreement that the, that the issue is so momentous that every branch of the, governor, uh, the government should be involved? SCA 14 fails on this. It just requires a two-thirds vote in both the houses, but it does not require any action from the governor. When you think in terms of uh, requiring uh, all public procedures of the legislature already defined in the Constitution to be audio-visually recorded and the recording to be posted within 24 hours, as guaranteed, SCA 14 falls short of that as well. How it, it, what it requires is that it be posted and it be posted in a timely fashion, but it doesn't have the teeth in it uh, that, that would make it an optimum bill. When thinking in terms of, uh, of being copied, so if you have this up here and somebody wants to take a copy for fear that uh, after a 20-year period it will be lost, and when you're looking at court rulings, often the judge goes back to look at the intent of the legislature to ensure that they're not misinterpreting the law that was passed. So having an archive that goes back deeper than 20 years or deeper than six years makes a lot of sense for that judicious rule. However, we aren't necessarily going to be able to guarantee that in perpetuity, but if there was a third party that wished to copy these items, and make them available, or just to copy them to hold for their own interest, SCA 14 does not provide and allow for that. However, CTLA does. You know, when I go through this, and there, there are many more points, I have to keep asking myself that simple fundamental question. Is this an improvement? Why are we rushing to put something on the ballot that is not an improvement, in my view, that what's already going to be on the ballot, unless we want to add confusion to the ballot. And I'd urge senators that we not add that confusion after a million people have signed the initiative asking for complete and utter transparency. Now, there's a reason why my good friend from Davis has worked so hard to get this, and it's never gotten any legs. And yet today it has legs, perhaps on this Senate floor. That's because some people may not want transparency. 
may not want to see their work. You know, I'm always loud and proud. I'm proud of what I do on this floor. I go to great efforts to send it out to my, out to my uh, constituents so they know that I'm working uh, on their behalf. Now, sometimes they agree with me, and, and sometimes they don't, and I hear from both sides all the time. But I believe transparency is utterly important when we're moving forward. So I have to ask, are you doing in the best interest of Californians? Why is this year a tipping point in getting this bill, this initiative, uh, SEA 14, this far? And by the way, if it was a better, if it was an improvement over what's currently offered, then I'd absolutely support it because I think it's a step in the right direction. But when I can have perfection over the good, I'm always going to fall with perfection. Because there's no enforcement in SCA 14, because uh, it doesn't provide all the protections that are available already on the ballot, I would urge that my colleagues would not create a competing initiative that potentially could undermine transparency in the long haul. So for that reason, while I respect my colleague from Davis, who's done such a fantastic job over the years tr on this issue, I would ask that she not vote for her own SCA 14, because I know in her heart she cares most about transparency. Senator Hertzberg. I, too, want to, uh, Madam President, join in the long list of colleagues to um, give credit to the author of this measure. She has worked for some time uh, against a lot of odds uh, dealing with this larger issue of transparency, which is important to our government. Whether you are of whatever party, confidence in government, in my judgment, is critical. We need to do everything we can with technology and, and everything in our power that we do as a deliberative body to ultimately engage in this discussion of ideas in this marketplace of ideas, but do it in a manner that imposes and reposes confidence in the electorate in our work. They may not agree with what we do, but it is important that they have respect for our process. That, to me, is critical. While I was out of government, I worked with uh, the author of this measure and actually participated, to some extent, on a ballot measure dealing with this issue. I think that what's critical to the California legislature as we think through and continue, like society has to do, reinvent ourselves all the time, we need to figure out ways to rewrite our rules so that we have greater deliberation of all of our measures at our committee in the House of Origin. What that looks like, I don't know, but I think this is a cornerstone or a piece of that debate. Because the reality is there shouldn't be measures that are ultimately done in the last 72 hours and whatever the measures are. That comes from what happened back in 1966 when Speaker Unruh and, and passed Proposition 1A and they changed the rules thinking that it was better. But again, what often happens in reform movements uh, is that the world changes. The, the folks in Tammany Hall were a reform movement, and all of a sudden they became a problem. There's so many examples of things that start out intentionally, and our job in this deliberation is to constantly keep a keen eye and to reinvent, to reassess, and to figure that out. So this is an important measure of transparency, but in my judgment, a very small step, but necessary step. Now, um, it was raised by another one of the, the, the senators in this House about whether or not um, ha comparing this measure to the ballot measure that's going on uh, the, this next ballot. I, as, as uh, the author indicated, stood in for her uh, last Wednesday at the Elections Committee, and, and we had a very uh, deliberative, long hearing in that regard, and listened very closely and respectfully. Now, I apologized to the authors about the lateness of this, I mean, of the proponents of the ballot measure, the lateness of our endeavor. It is what it is. We should have been dealing with this a while ago, but unfortunately, one, one of the challenges as we deal with so many compelling issues, whether we're dealing with development disabled, transportation, go down the list, or, or uh, you know the MCO tax and the like, it's hard often 
for a legislative branch to deal with everything at once. One of the reasons why this body uh, passed SB 1253 in the last session that was co-authored by the pro tem was to try to harmonize the discussion between ballot proponents and this body as we um, consider public policy matters. So the whole th idea of moving up this discussion is we know the, under the old law, we never had discussions until after the budget was done and way, it was way too late. And basically hearings weren't really hearings, but there were infomercials for each side to advocate their points of view. We now have a process, albeit late, albeit clumsy, albeit not perfect, but a process to engage in that discussion. And that's what we're doing now under Steinberg's measure 1253. There is a right to withdraw of the proponents. And the question is, again, apologize for the lateness of it, but it's an honest, sincere effort of a body that's dealing with a whole host of other issues. And unfortunately, we can't deal with them all at once of trying to figure that out. So in listening to what was discussed by the proponents, Th uh, the author listened, and the author made changes, and the author added a number of items when asked, when the proponent was asked, hey, what are some things we could do to improve this that was mentioned earlier? Is this a better measure? Well, first, there was some discussion, I, I'll call it lawyer language, as to how this worked between both houses and, and the 72-hour notice, but it was made clear, at least in my judgment. There were, there were issues that may, were clarified whether or not uh, a violation of a bill would mean that the bill didn't become law in terms of how it was written, clarified. Requiring every legislative vote to be recorded, clarified. Requiring the legislature to make recordings available, clarified. In addition, new items, new ideas, things that do not exist in the current initiative that is presently planning to go before the voters. Eliminating the limitation on the use of recording and the place of public domain. New idea, check, done. Ensure that audiovisual archives are kept with advanced technology, check, done. Requiring and adding in to the legislature to make reasonable attempts for live stream hearing, something that was said this would be a good idea. New idea, check, done, in the legislation. Eliminate the copyright challenges that were raised by some folks who care deeply about that, added into the provision and got their support, check, done. Provide flexibility for hearings in remote locations, often difficult, added to the process, check, done. Ensure future legislatures appropriately fund for these transparency issues, check, done. Is it perfect? No. Could there be, should there be some additional discussions? Because at the end of the day, what we now face with respect to this measure is not a public deliberation of what should or shouldn't be done. It's a deliberation between the legislative branch, both houses on the one hand, and a proponent who controls the right to withdraw under SB 1253. And that's the question. And all I can say is that the author, the leadership of this house have, have uh, and I, I can only apologize because the way the process works, but it is not an issue of bad faith. It is an issue of good faith. It is a nature of the management conditions of how you have to deal with issues. We just had to deal with the budget yesterday. How many decisions were made there? How many meetings were made there? How many things had to be dealt with? Unfortunately, they're only 24 hours in a day. It is very difficult. So I just, I think passing this thing on and having continued discussions in the other house to try to reach an accommodation, we don't want, I certainly don't want to have competing measures. I certainly think there's an opportunity to reach a meeting of the minds. Uh, it, it, it is what it is, as, as we like to say. And so uh, I support this and I, and I just want to send the message to the proponents. I want to send the message to both parties that this is a sincere effort. And I think the test is, is it a better measure? Is it something that's better? Not because one person and their advisors made a decision to make it better, but in your view, in your judgment, as representing each of you nearly a million people, and the other house nearly a half a million people, that it's better. And I would suggest that it's better. And I just want to close, not only to support this, but to say to all of you, and every opportunity I get to stand on this floor, is that we have to now take this to the next level. Not to say that this ultimately solves all the problems that we have a 72-hour process, but that we need committees that cook bills, that we change the rules to be able to really deliberate and give pride and honor to our work 
so that when it gets out of a policy committee, it's not a work in progress, which I have asked many times to people to do. I'm not standing on my high horse because I've done the same thing. But the rules don't work. And what we're facing with today, with this measure, is a very small step in a very large leap of what we need to do as a branch of government to bring honor, continue to bring honor and dignity and intelligence to this work. Because as we like to talk about our role, and I think it's true on a national and international stage, and how many eyes are on us, that we need to make sure that everything that we do is excellent. This is an important step in that regard. Thank you, Senator Hertzberg. Senator Morlock. Thank you, Madam President. I want to uh, thank the Senator from Yolo County for all of her hard work and diligence. This is God's work, this is very important. I just want to share that I've been there and I've done that in Orange County, which is about 1 11th of the population of California. We had a, a rather powerful interest group gather signatures and put together a ballot measure. And we had two choices. Uh, one was to just oppose it and fight against this interest group. The other was to do a competing ballot measure, which is what I did. And I, I wrote uh, another measure that was very similar, but incorporated the ideas that I thought would be better for the County of Orange. I was treasurer at the time, it was in 2000. And I uh, was able to get the Board of Supervisors to put it on the ballot. So it was a, a battle between Measure G and Measure H. And uh, my measure was given the G uh, and because I was an elected official, the opponents said, well, Measure G stands for government, more government. So they had a, a whale of a time. Uh, I also want to thank the senator from Van Nuys for all the arguments that he's made. I, the, the bill that is right, it's got all the right components, but I will tell you that once you put two ballot measures that are very similar on the ballot and you have competing ballot measures, the party with the most money will win. And I have a funny feeling that the party that has already gathered one million signatures, already has a lot of them certified and probably will have it approved next week, is not going to back down. So now you're going to go through the process of filling up another measure, another proposition on the November ballot, which is already the largest ballot in the last 16, since six, more than 16 years. So you're gonna put the voters through uh, the trials and tribulations of looking at one more proposition, but they're both gonna be very identical. How are you gonna, you're gonna have to have an, a, a campaign that says vote no on theirs, vote yes on ours, because the one that has the highest votes wins. And that's just gonna just belabor the whole process. In November, I'm just gonna tell you make a prediction that if we put both of these propositions on the ballot, SCA 14 will lose. So I'm not here to discourage you, but I'm just saying I, I've been there. I want to thank you for all your work, but I would urge a no vote. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Morlock. Senator Gain. 